Ladies and gentlemen, honored dignitaries, and all veterans of our United States military services, my name is Debbie Schmidt. I am the current president of the Schaumburg Hoffman Estates Rotary Club, and I, it is my honor to serve as your MC today. Immediately to my left is Gail Bettison, our sign, sign language interpreter. It is my distinguished pleasure to welcome you to our Joint Communities Memorial Day observance, especially today as we are recognizing the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I, which began on July 14, 1914. Before we begin, we ask that you turn off all cell phones and pagers. And now, please rise if you are able and remove all hats and non-religious headgear. You may now be seated. Our national anthem was sung by the legends and the musical prelude was played by our own Spring Valley Concert Band. Thank you both for your fine musical tributes. We now invite Senior Pastor Jerry Hayes of this St. Peter Lutheran Church to come forward and lead us in prayer. 
I want to begin by welcoming you to St. Peter on behalf of all the members of St. Peter Lutheran Church. Um, we thank you. We thank you for coming here today and being a part of this most necessary occasion to give thanks to God for all who have given their lives in the line of duty. And we also take opportunity today to give thanks to God for those of you who have served in the armed forces or who are currently serving in the armed forces. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we do give you thanks for the many men and women who have been in service to this country that allow us the freedoms that we have to even have a celebration as we have this very day. I thank you, Lord, that you have brought together so many invested volunteers to make this event happen. And we pray now, Lord, that it would just be a perfect tribute to all of those who have served and continue to serve so that once again, we can enjoy the freedoms of this great nation. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In 2008, Schomburg Village President Al Larson and Hoffman Estates Mayor Bill McLeod requested that our communities meet and organize this annual Memorial Day obs observation program. It is fitting that we now invite them each to come forward and be recognized as part of this sacred observance. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mayor William Bill McLeod, Village of Hoffman Estates. wonderful to see so many of you here as we honor those who served, bled, and died for our country. This is a long-standing tradition we've had of honoring those who served and died at St. Peter's, the joint uh, venture of the uh, village of Schomburg and the village of Hoffman Estates. It's great to see so many of you here. I know General John A. Logan of uh, the Grand Army of the Republic shortly after the Civil War was concerned that as time went by, the people of this country would forget the service of those, the sacrifice of those who died. And uh, I'm sure that General Logan would be pleased to see so many of you here today to honor all those who made the ultimate sacrifice their lives. General Eisenhower um, once said he thought so much uh, focus on generals was, was, was wrong. Generals, generals and admirals and Air Force commanders can come up with every plan they want, every great battle plan. <clears throat> but it's the people on the ground, the people on the, sh in the ships, the people in the air that win the battle, not the general. What uh, I think we need to remember as a people, so many of these people did die to preserve our freedom for 238 years that we've enjoyed it wasn't an accident. Freedom isn't free. Our charge as a people is to be worthy of the sacrifice that those men and women made. Are we worthy of that sacrifice? Did they not die in vain? That's what we have to examine in our own lives and how we conduct the business of this country and the businesses of all of our communities. Uh, Chester Nimitz, the great admiral, commander in the Pacific said that, speaking of his forces, that uncommon valor was a common virtue. General Patton said that uh, we must remember the heroic dead, but you have to remember there's a lot of heroic alive out there. We're blessed to be in the presence today of the heroic alive. Thank you to all of you who served. Let's always remember those who died fighting for this great country. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor Larson's going to come forward now. Mayor. President Al Larson from the village of Schaumburg.
Distinguished guests, fellow citizens, members of the armed forces, family members, and honored veterans. Once again, we gather here on Memorial Day to pay our respects to the brave men and women who paid for, their, for our freedom. We acknowledge their, their lives and their deaths by taking this small part of our lives, by taking these few minutes from our days, by saying the words and remembering the wars and, and praying that their sacrifice not have to be repeated. It's a small price for us to pay after what they have paid, coming here and hearing the music, paying the tributes, listening to the familiar words in memory of their valor, in tribute to their gift to us. They have shown that freedom has a price. They are a continuing reminder of our gener one generation sacrifice for another. The familiar sound of taps fades away into, into this distance, and we all pause to remember. But the sounds of their sacrifice resound every minute of every day in all of our lives. It's the sound of the morning paper landing at the stoop, the sound of church bells calling to worship. It's the carefree laughter of children returning home from school. It's the sound of traffic in the streets, on the roads, traveling to work, to vacation, to college, to a ball game, wherever and whenever. It's, it's sound is music, all kinds of music. It's sermons and speeches and lectures and even commercials. It's the noise of legislators debating in Springfield, of school boards discussing policy, of the village boards passing resolutions. It's the sound of freedom. And it's something that happens here in America every day and every week of every year because of them. Because of what they did yesterday's ago, our tomorrows resound in a noise and music and laughter and shouts of freedom. We too easily forget. Things get in the way. Life crowds in and memories of those who are just memories fade. That is why we gather here on Memorial Day to renew our, our pledge to not forget, to remind ourselves always to remember to take from here a new commitment to cherish deeply what these brave men and brave women have brought with their lives, and to teach our children and grandchildren that the foundation of our freedom was built by the sacrifices of those fallen heroes, and that the very least we owe them for that is a solemn thank you and a sacred promise always to remember. And now I'd like to invite Mayor McLeod to come and read a proclamation. Bill? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Both the Village of Hoffman Estates and the Village of Schomburg did a similar proclamation, so we'll be making a presentation and we'll read the proclamation. Whereas World War I was fraught from 1914 through 1918, and every ocean and almost every continent, whereas World War I was also known as the Great War, the World War, the War of the Nations, and the War to End All Wars. And whereas World War I was a turning point in world history, involving more than 65 million men from 30 countries, among them thousands of Sikh soldiers of the British Army, whereas World War I claimed the lives of over 16 million and wounded over 20 million people across the globe, whereas on July 28, 2014, the world will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of this war, which lasted until no November 11, 1918. Whereas we should look back over the century, which remember those who died during the war, did not die in vain. Whereas on May 26, 2014, Memorial Day observance will take place at the Hoffman Estates Veterans Memorial in Hoffman Estates, followed by St. Peter Lutheran Church in Schaumburg, which will allow all those present to always remember and to honor the courage and sacrifices made by those soldiers. Be there, for, be there so resolved that William McLeod and Al Larson, acting under the authority of the, by virtue of the authority vested in them by the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and the laws of the village of Schaumburg and Hoffman Estates, hereby proclaim Monday, May 26, 2014, as First World War 100th Anniversary Commemoration Day, and also hereby proclaim July 2014, as First World War 100th Anniversary 1914-1918 Remembrance. We urge all of you to observe remember his observance. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, Mayor McLeod and Village President Larson for being with us today. And thanks to both the Village of Hoffman Estates and the Village of Schaumburg for the proclamations honoring today's historical significance. We now invite Dick Amrine, current 9th District Adjutant and past commander of our American Legion post 1983 to come forward and read General Order 11. Upon conclusion, Dick will explain the significance and presentation of our POW MIA table setting. Headquarters of the Republic, General Order Number 11, Washington, D.C., May 5th, 1868. The 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the Great Rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. We are organized comrades, as our regulations tell us, for the purpose, among other things, of preserving and strengthening those kind of and fraternal feelings which have bound together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who united to suppress the late, uh, the late foes. Their soldier lives were the reveille of freedom to a race in chains, and their deaths the tattoo of rebellious tyranny in arms. We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. All that the consecrated wealth and taste of the nation can add to their adornment and security is but a, billing, a fitting tribute to the memory of her slain defenders. Let no wanton foot tread rudely on such hallowed grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverent visitors and fond mourners. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time, testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of a free and undivided republic. If other eyes grow dull, other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, Ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remain to us. Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with the choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag they saved from dishonor. Let us in this solemn presence renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us a sacred charge upon a nation's gratitude, the soldier and sailor's widow and orphan. It is the purpose of the Commander-in-Chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope that it will be kept up from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his departed comrades. He earnestly desires the public press to lend its friendly and aid in bringing the notice of comrades in all parts of the country in time for simultaneous compliance therewith. Department commanders will use efforts to make this order effective. By order of John A. Logan, Commander-in-Chief. Ladies and gentlemen, you may have noticed our POW MIA display table in the, in the narthex area when you entered. I would now like to explain what it represents. The table of honor is set for one. This table is our way of symbolizing the act that members of our profession of arms are missing from our midst. They are called POWs or MIAs. We call them brothers. They are unable to be with us today. The table is round to show our everlasting concern for our missing men and women. The tablecloth is white. It 
It symbolized the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose displayed in a vase reminds us of the families and loved ones of our comrade in arms who keep faith awaiting their return. And the red ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the red ribbon worn on the lapel and breasts of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting of our missing. A slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. And there is salt on the bread plate, symbolic of the family tears as they wait. The Bible represents the strength gained through faith to sustain those lost from our country, founded as one nation under God. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us tonight. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope which lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home, away from their captors, to the open arms of a grateful nation. The table is set for one. It symbolizes the frailty of one prisoner against his oppressors. The chair is empty. They are not here. All of you who served with them called them comrades and, do, and who depended on their might and aid and relied on them. For surely they have not forsaken you. May God forever watch over them, protect them, and their families. Thank you, Dick. We now ask Joe Wine, current 4th District Commander and past post commander of VFW 2202, to come forward and describe the Battlefield Monument. Good morning. To my right hand side here is the Battlefield Monument. Many of you may have seen this in pictures or on the news, but I'd like to describe what each piece of it means. First and foremost, in the front on the bottom, we have the five service flags of every branch of the service to represent the men and women who sacrificed for our nation throughout the five branches of uniformed service. The central part of this monument is a rifle. The rifle has had the magazine removed, the last round has been fired, and it is ready for inspection. There are a set of ID tags hanging on the rifle, commonly referred to as dog tags. This set has no name, no serial number, and no religious preference because it represents all people who have served in our nation in time of war, time of peace. Down below there are a pair of boots. A soldier's best friend is his own two feet, and the boots are very significant. These boots have no polish, and they have been worn almost to the sole. And on a personal note, these exact pair of boots here are from 
a member of our post that passed away recently. These are the boots that he wore in Vietnam for two years. The most important part of this monument is a folded American flag. The American flag is held on top of the boots, never to touch the ground. That flag <clears throat> is symbolic of the flag to cover the caskets of our brave men and women throughout the last few centuries. And that flag can also represent to many of you who may have loved ones who are veterans, and that flag is in your home and represents their service. So this is the Battlefield Monument. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinguished pleasure to introduce our 2014 guest speaker. He entered the military service in 1968 and then served a tour in Vietnam from 1969 to 1970, fighting with the 1st Air Cavalry. For his heroic efforts, he was awarded an Air Medal and two Bronze Stars, one with an Oak Leaf Cluster. He is a current member and past commander of VFW Post 2992 in Des Plaines. David has also held many positions as commander at the district, state, and national levels. He is also a member of American Legion Post 36 in Des Plaines <coughs> and serves as current vice president of the Pillars of Honor. David is also the son of a World War II veteran. Let's welcome First Lieutenant David M. Murphy. Thank you, Debbie. Just like to say, I am truly honored to be here today with so many heroes and legends who served our nation by wearing the uniform of their country. We are also gathered today in honor of the brave heroes who have made the ultimate sacrifice. <clears throat> I'd like to begin this observance with a silent moment to remember a close friend of mine who lost his battle with leukemia on April the 25th. An individual who would have been your keynote speaker today, a Vietnam veteran, a member of Schomburg Post 2202 and president of Pillars of Honor, Stephen Schaefer. Thank you. Since the inception of Memorial Day, more than 100 years ago, Many words have been written and many words have been spoken on behalf of countless others who fought and died and relinquished their precious gift of life so that others could live free. This year, we once again tried to compose fitting words to suitably honor absent comrades we struggle to find the right words that appropriately convey our gratitude and appreciation for the gift of freedom they have given us. In our hearts, we know our missing friends and comrades are deserving of every honor and acknowledgement a grateful nation can provide. But of all of the things, that we can do, the very least is to hold the memory of them close to fulfill the promise and poignancy of their sacrifices. We gather not only as a nation, wholly united in solemn remembrance of the defenders of our republic, but also as people who have been wounded by war. But as in the past, even though we mourn for what has been lost, there needs to come for us to move forward. 
Although wounded, we shall heal. As we mend, we needn't look back and think about what might have been. But we will look to the future and think of what yet is to be. Throughout our nation's history, we have been blessed to have persons who were genuinely committed to something larger than them. People who understood duty for the greater good. The noble defenders of our nation have performed the highest form of public service. The men and women serving in today's military continue that tradition of service. And for that, we are deeply grateful. Those who are in today's military face the world that is fraught with change and challenge as they are thrust into the boiling cauldron of war and conflict. We must care for them and their families. We have an obligation to do so. For us to do anything less would diminish and cheapen the sacrifice of more than one million patriots who had died in defense of our country. They are the reason we, as a nation, are unique among all other nations of the world. Our friends and comrades, the defenders of our nation, understood the price of freedom. With courage and conviction, they did what was demanded. They answered the call. There is no better way to honor those who have done more than you or I, those who did more than any of us, than to capture the essence of what they have given and drawn upon it, to strengthen our spirit as a nation. Many people from across the world stand united in remembrance today. We speak in one voice, with shared admiration and respect, and in thanks. The freedoms we enjoy today were purchased at the expense of human life. The sum total of who we are as a nation and as a people is mirrored in their sacrifices. Walk the hollow ground amongst the final resting places of our nation's best and brightest. And you will come to understand that every grade, every marker bears a name. Every name represents a person who was loved by someone and who loved someone in return a person with hopes and dreams. We stand united in our grief, and we grieve alongside their loved ones and share equally in their loss. Gone from someone's life are sons and daughters, husbands and wives, sisters and brothers, everyday heroes, they loved their families, their friends, and their country. This is a day to cherish their memory and to celebrate and ensure, oh, celebrate the courage and deeds of all veterans who have served the nation. Let us give thanks every day of our lives for them. We were fortunate to have been able to know them, even if it were only for a blessed, brief, and shiny moment. We are connected by spirit and treasured memories of departed friends. As well, they have rightfully earned our gratitude, our respect, 
and a place of honor among us. And we will work to instill and keep their honor, for that is how honor is kept. As we pay tribute to our absent friends, let us determine today, this special day, to assure those who have best earned it, our veterans, the proper medical care for the wounds or infirmities. To the veterans out there, you men and women raised your right hand and said you would serve your country wherever you were needed. Five branches of the service with many jobs to perform. Some served on the front line while others served in support. And we thank you for what you did. You men and women, today's veteran taught us what it was like to be a patriot. And about love of country, you taught us about humility. You left your homes, served your country, returned home, and picked up where you left off, never complaining, never bragging, just happy to be home and happy to have served your country. Some of you veterans have talked about your days in the service, and we thank you for sharing that part of history. Some of you haven't talked about your service, and we ask that you share your experience, good or bad, serious or funny, with your friends and loved ones. You see, folks need to hear your part of history, so that history isn't lost. In closing, let us be more than determined to see to it that no man or woman who has served be homeless, unemployed, or sick. If we truly want to honor the dead, then we must help the living. All of us can have a hand in demanding our nation's veterans receive the benefits and entitlements that they have earned and deserve. Let us resolve right now, today, to do just that. I would urge everyone to be steadfast in your commitment to the veterans of the nation and ensure our nation life lives up to its obligations to our nation veterans. Thank you for being here today. God bless you. God bless our fallen. God bless America. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Tom Alderson, current adjutant of VFW 2202 and retired U.S. Army Master Sergeant, who will speak about the 100th anniversary of World War I. Good morning. Before I speak about World War I, I just wanted to point out that today, we were able to get two history trunks from the Cantini Museum, which is the home of the 1st Infantry Division, and being a member of the Society of the 1st Infantry Division, I was very happy they could provide it. But there's some uniforms, some field equipment that was uh, used in World War I, so you can see exactly the conditions that the soldiers needed, needed to, uh, to live with. I'm honored today to tell you a little bit about World War I. World War I initially had many names. In America, it was actually called the European War. In Canada, Maclean's magazine in October 1914 said some wars named themselves. This is the Great War. From the time of its occurrence <coughs> until the approach of World War II, 
It was called simply the World War, the Great War, or the War to End All Wars. And after World War II, First World War, or World War I stuck. No matter what we call it, it was a global war centered in Europe that began on 28 July 1914 and lasted until 11 November 1918. The war drew in all the world's great economic powers, which were assembled in two opposing alliances. The Allies, which was the, uh, the United Kingdom, France, and the Russian Empire, and the central powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary. Although Italy was also a member of the Triple Alliance alongside Germany and Austria-Hungary, it did not join the powers as the Austrian-Hungary Empire had violated terms of the alliance. Now these alliances were both reorganized and expanded and almost all nations in the world ended up entering this war. By the time the war ended, it was truly a world war. From 1914 to 1918, over 100 countries from Africa, the Americas, Asia, the Australias, the Euro and Europe were part of the conflict. Ultimately, more than 70 million military, including, including 60 million Europeans, were mobilized in one of the largest wars in history. Although a resurgence of imperialism was an underlying cause, the immediate trigger for the war was the 28 June 1914 assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, heir to the throne of the Austrian-Hungary Empire by Yugoslav nationalist Gravillo Princip in Sarajevo. This set up a diplomatic crisis with Austria-Hungary delivered an ultimatum to the Kingdom of Serbia and international alliances over the previous decades were invoked. The, assassin the assassination led to a month of diplomatic maneuvering between Austria-Hungary, Germany, Russia, France, and Britain, which was called the July Crisis. Within weeks of the diplomatic maneuverings, everything had failed, the major powers were at war, and the conflict soon spread around the world. The sequence of events occurred so quickly that on 28 July, only 30 days after the assassination, the Austro-Hungarians Austria fired the first shots in preparation for the invasion of Serbia. As Russia mobilized, Germany invaded Belgium and Luxembourg before moving towards France, leading Britain to declare war on Germany. After Germany marched on Paris was halted, what became known as the Western Front settled into a battle of attrition, with a trench line that would change little until 1917. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, the Russian army was successful against the Austro-Hungarians, but stopped in its invasion of East Prussia by the Germans. In November 1914, the Ottoman Empire joined the war, opening fronts in the Caspian, Mesopotamia, and Sinai. Italy and Bulgaria also went to war in 1915. Romania joined the war in 1916, and the United States finally in 1917. But that's what everybody else was doing in the world. Let's talk about the United States and what was going on here at home. When the war began, the United States proclaimed a united policy of strict neutrality. In thought and deed, as President Woodrow Wilson put it, his goal was to broker a peace, and he sent his top aide, Colonel House, on repeated missions to the Allies and the Central Powers. But they were all so confident in victory that the peace effort was ignored. While we had declared our nation as neutral, American public opinion was strongly divided. Most Americans, until early 1917, were strongly of the opinion that the United States should stay out of the war. Opinion changed, changed gradually, partly in response to Germans at Germany actions in neutral Belgium and the sinking of the Lusitania. 
For our younger people here, the Lusitania was a British ocean liner which ferried people and goods across the Atlantic Ocean between the United States and Britain. It was torpedoed by a German U-boat and sunk on May 7, 1915. Of the 1,959 people on board, 1,198 died, including 128 Americans. The sinking of the Lusitania enraged Americans and hastened the United States entrance into World War I. Back to 1914, though. In the general public, there was little support for entering the war on the side of Germany. The great majority of German Americans, as well as Scandinavian Americans, wanted the United States to remain neutral. The Irish Catholic community, based in the large cities, was strongly hostile to helping Britain in any way, especially after the defeat of the Easter Uprising in 1916 in Ireland, with the aims of ending British rule. Most of the Protestant leaders in the United States, regardless of their theology, favored peaceful solutions whereby the United States would broker a peace. Most of the leaders of the women's movement, typified by Jane Addams, who founded Hull House in Chicago, likewise sought a peaceful solution. The more prominent of war opponents was industrialist Henry Ford, who personally financed and led a peace ship to Europe to try to negotiate among the belligerents. That effort also went nowhere. On the other hand, Britain had significant support among intellectuals and families with close ties to Britain. The most prominent leader there was Samuel Insull of Chicago, a leading industrialist who, in, who had immigrated from England. Insull founded propaganda efforts. He financed uh, young Americans who wished to go to Canada and join the military there. By 1915, Americans were paying much more attention to the war. The sinking of the Lusitania aroused furious denunciations of, Brit of German brutality. By 1915, in eastern cities, a new preparedness movement emerged. It argued that the United States needed to immediately build up a strong naval and land force for defensive purposes, an unspoken assumption that America would soon fight. The driving forces behind preparedness were people like General Leonard Wood, ex-president Theodore Roosevelt, and former secretaries of war Root and Stimson. They enlisted many of the nation's most powerful bankers, industrialists, lawyers, and families to help in the movement to get the U.S. prepared for war. The preparedness movement had what was called a realism philosophy of world affairs. They believed that economic strength and military muscle were more decisive than idealistic crusades focused on causes like democracy and national self-determination. They emphasized over and over again the weak state of national defenses. They showed that America's 100,000-man army, even augmented by the 112,000 National Guardsmen, was outnumbered 20 to 1 by just the German army. They called for UMT, Universal Military Service, under which the 600,000 men who turned 18 every year would be required to spend six months in military training, then be assigned to reserve units. The smaller regular army would primarily be a training agency. The public opinion, however, was not willing to go that far. Both the regular army and the preparedness leaders had a low opinion of the National Guard, which was so politicized, provincial, poorly armed, ill-trained, to and too inclined to idealistic crusades, as was found in the British can excuse me, Spanish campaign of 1898, and too lacking in understanding of world affairs. The National Guard, on the other hand, was securely rooted in a state and local politics, with representatives from a very broad section of American society. The Guard was the one of the nation's few institutions that in some northern states accepted blacks on equal footing. So while we are, had declared our nation neutral, it did not mean we all agreed. And while we had a standing army, it was not near able to deploy a measurable force. So how did we go to war? 
Well, actually, it's in a strange twist of politics. After narrowly winning re-election in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson unleashed thousands of four-minute men who gave propaganda speeches on corners. They were called the four-minute men because their speeches would last about four minutes on why we should enter the war. This helped convince the public that we needed to go to war. And so in early 1917, the United States entered the war on the side of the Allies. What we found when we got in the war was that the military tactics before World War I had failed to keep pace in technology. These advances allowed for impressive defense systems with outdated military tactics. And they couldn't break or make a breakthrough in any of the lines during the war. Our troops faced miles and rows of barbed wire, which was a significant hindrance to massed infantry advances. Artillery coupled with machine guns made crossing open ground extremely difficult, to say the least. Commanders on both sides failed to develop tactics to breach the trenches. German trenches were better constructed than those of the Allied forces, which were intended to be temporary before their forces broke through the German defenses. This trench for warfare was a breeding ground for disease and also lent itself to use by a new weapon in horror of war that had not been seen, chemical warfare. Chemical warfare was used by both sides as they tried to break the stalemate. On 22 April 1915, the Germans violated the Hague Convention and used chlorine gas for the first time on the Western Front. Chemical weapons in World War I were primarily used to demoralize, injure, and kill entrenched defenders, against whom the indiscriminate and generally slow-moving and static nature of gas would be most effective. The types of gas employed range from disabling chemicals, such as tear gas and severe mustard gas, to lethal agents like phosgene and chlorine gas. This chemical warfare was a major component of the first global war and first total war of the 20th century. Poison gas became one of the most feared and best remembered wars of war. In World War I, we also saw the first use of tanks in combat by the British in September 1916 with only partial success since their top speed was four miles an hour. However, their effectiveness would grow as the war progressed. As a result of the stalemate in the trenches and the introduction of chemical gas and tanks, the total number of military and civilian casualties of World War I was well over 36 million. There were over 16 million deaths, 20 million wounded, and the war ranked as the sixth deadliest conflict in human history. America lost 116,708 military personnel, 757 civilians for a total of 117,465 dead, and over 204,000 wounded. Unfortunately, this war solved very little and set up the world for more strife later, as was witnessed by World War II only 20 years later. But there was some good that came out of this war. Imperialism throughout the globe declined with the end of the Ottoman and Austrian-Hungarian empires, the beginning of the end of the British Empire. The role of women was enhanced and advancement of the suffrage movement occurred. Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Lu Yugoslavia were newly formed and recognized countries. New York replaced London as the world financial center. The League of Nations was formed after the Peace of Paris. And the US, believe it or not, was owed over $11 billion. And finally, it was the start of ceremonies like these, where we can take time to think of those that fought for freedom and made the greatest sacrifice to achieve for us the privileges that freedom provide. Today, today we take time to remember those who made it back and recently passed and be thankful for their service as well. Today, we remember. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time I ask that retired U.S. Army Sergeant First Class and current post commander of American Legion post-1983, Thomas Sazadel, and U.S. Marines Lance, Lance Corporal and current post commander of VFW post-2202, Marco Debetic, to come forward to present this year's annual award. At this time, I am honored to, to introduce you to this year's Schomburg Area Veteran Special Award nominee. His service to his country started during World War II when he joined the United States Navy, where he served aboard a ship. After his hitch in the Navy was up, he enlisted in the United States Army. He was assigned to many units, but during the Korean War, he was assigned to the 555th Artillery Battalion, better known as the Triple Nickel, stationed in Hawaii. This same unit was later attached to the 5th Regimental Combat Team and deployed to Korea. While serving in Korea, he was wounded seven separate times, as well as being awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, the Silver and Bronze Star for Valor. He was eventually med medically evacuated to Tripler Army Hospital for injuries sustained in the combat zone. But like many veterans, when he left the service, he did not stop serving his community. Our recipient of the 2014 Veteran of the Year Award is a founding member of our po VFW Post 2202, active in his church and as well known by both the police and fire personnel, he is also the Volunteer of the Year in Schomburg area. Ladies and gentlemen and honored guests, the 2014 Schomburg area Veteran Special Award Winner is Sergeant First Class Retired Bud Napier. Thank you, commanders, and congratulations to you, Bud Napier. Each year, our VFW selects and sponsors local youth to compete in a statewide Voice of Democracy speech contest. We are privileged to have with us today Claire Donahue, a junior at James B. Conant High School, to present her speech, Why I'm Optimistic About the Future. Let's bring her up with a warm welcome. This country is headed in the right direction, and there are many reasons why I am optimistic about the future. One important factor is the role women now play in society. This country has gave women the role of a mother and a housewife, but in today's world that is no longer the case. Allowing women to educate themselves and involve them in the business world of this country is a huge stepping stone. Now that women and men are working and making a living, our country has more room to prosper. Adding women into the workforce doubles the amount of available workers. Without women becoming educated, half of this population would be useless in the workforce. Women have greatly helped this country succeed. People like Marissa Mayer, the president and CEO of Yahoo, and Cheryl Sandberg, operating officer of Facebook, would have never been discovered if the role of woman had remained the same. 
Now that men and women are becoming educated, this country's success has significantly increased. It is easy to be pessimistic about where this country is headed, but statistics show that despite the common assumption that we are doomed and this country is falling apart, we are most definitely headed in the right direction. The fear that we are ruining our environment is becoming a very popular opinion. However, our country's rivers, lakes, seas, and air are becoming cleaner every day, despite the assumption we are dirtying our world. Animals that were nearly extinct, such as our bald eagle, are now booming in population. As a country, the United States is more energy efficient and greener than ever before. Technology has also played an extremely vital role in today's world and has most definitely had a positive impact on the United States. Justice is improving incredibly. Over 234 innocent, innocent Americans have been freed due to advances in DNA and fingerprint testing. Technology has exposed false convictions and has helped identify true criminals. People are living much longer and healthier lives today due to the technological advances in the medical field. Technology as a whole has made this country much more efficient in almost everything. Our advances in the technological field are incredible and only getting better, which is a main reason why I am very optimistic about the future this country holds. Many have lost all hope in the government and even more so the economy. But taking a look at the economy at a statistical standpoint will lead you to much optimism. For the third consecutive year this month, month this year, more than 200,000 jobs have been added and companies are beginning to invest again. Yes, the economy is still struggling and may continue to do so for another year, but there is no doubt it is on the uprise again. We live in a democracy. Not one man is too powerful, nor will one man ever be too powerful. We have political differences, so not one party is too powerful, nor will one party ever be too powerful. Our checks and balances between the three branches of government are still in place. This country's government is no way failing and will only improve. Our country is fighting for total equality, not only between sexes, but also between race, religion, sexual orientations, and more. We live in a country that offers education to everyone, no matter who you are or where you are from. We have a republic that will never get too powerful and the people will always have a say. It is easy to say that this country is on the downfall and many people have lost all hope, but that is just not the case. We take many things for granted that other places in the world do not have. Technology, environmental improvements, the role of women, the recovering economy, and much more give me great optimism that the country is on the uprise. Statistics show the United States is nowhere near falling, and we have only improved throughout the past 100 years, and will continue to do so. The bad times we were in was temporary, and it is completely normal for a government to have a bad couple years. But looking at the big picture, only good things have occurred. Many people look at the past through rose-colored glasses, remembering only the good things and wishing the present was as simple as the past. The truth is, the good old days had just as many problems as the present. Every country faces conflicts, and it is just easy to say we are doomed, but looking at the facts, that mindset is just illogical. We are an incredible country with an incredible government, and the only place we are headed is towards improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, and congratulations on your achieved honors. You have made your parents and all the members of our communities proud of your achievements and happy to hear your presentation today. As our Spring Valley Concert Band performs their medleys of military branch songs, please feel free to sing along with the music. We do ask that all military personnel and veterans present to stand and be recognized when the, mu the music from your branch of service is played. We thank you for our, your service to our great free country.
Now, it is now time to recognize another group of dignitaries. They are not here with us today in person, but are ever present in our hearts and living memories. I refer to those veterans from our area and military services who have recently passed on. I am assisted by our bell ringer, Jeff Winkenwerder, current president of the Schomburg AM Rotary Club. Clarence Bud Abbott. William Dale Anderson. Clarence S. Arnold. John W. Batty. Lawrence F. Benson, Sr. S. Gurdev Singh Batal. Harmon J. Bove, Jr. Lawrence James DiMaggio. Kurt W. Eichhorn. Harry C. Gambala. Walter Gambala. Charles Henry. Frank R. Huzik, Sr. Richard Paul Kazanko. John Karpiak. Peter F. Mano. Donald H. Miller. Tom Mueller. William Bill Olson. Stuart L. Olson. Leonard Ross. James E. Pinson. Ronald J. Roy. Francis Michael Schultz. Stephen Schaefer. Aurelio B. Solis. James E. Stevens. <clears throat> Dean R. Thornton. Chester Joseph Wendell. <clears throat> Harry William Woodville. Frank J. Zick, and I was also presented one name today, Steve Reidner. Each Memorial Day, we gather in this sanctuary to honor those military personnel who have given the final full measure of devotion, their lives in sacrifice for the freedoms we all enjoy. But for every fallen American hero, there remains behind wives, children, brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents, whose task it is to pick up the pieces for the loss of that fallen hero, 
and continue life. Today, the Legends Choral Ensemble would like to pay tribute to those in our audience who have lost a loved one in defense of our country with the singing of the ones left standing. Who on earth could ever explain The great mysteries of life Or the mournful and untimely face of death But as long as we remain We grow better, even stronger Though we'll never be the same Cause the ones left standing have to dry all the tears and replay all the memories that could have been through the years and we shoulder the weight of the work left to be done and the ones left standing carry on the peace of God will abide in the season of our sorrow in the valley of a pain we can't describe in the palm of his hand is a shelter from the madness we can never really understand cause the ones left standing have to dry all the tears and replay all the memories the good and bad from the years and we shoulder the weight of the work left to be done and the ones left standing carry on oh, and in eternity when all the mysteries are gone it will be clear it was our God keeping us strong have to dry all the tears and replay all the memories the good and bad from the years and we shoulder the weight of the work left to be done and the ones left standing carry on and we shoulder the weight of the work left to be done and the ones left standing carry on the ones left standing carry on carry call on Reverend Alan Eaton, Chaplain of Schaumburg and Hoffman Estates Police and Fire Departments, to provide us with a closing prayer and benediction. In honor of Bud, I think we ought to take up an offering. <laughs> because any time I receive Bud out, he's asking, he's asking him, I'm taking up an offering. So I think we ought to take one up for you today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Take a hand of somebody beside you. This is the thing I love about today. This is the time in which we are united. Take a look at that. We are united. We have the image here of the missing in action. Look around and see your neighbors that are missing from action. Any time in our society in which we have something happens that goes against the grain of all we believe in, we need to stand up and say, come, take our hand, join with us, don't be missing from action. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, this love that you have given to us, we give back to one another 
and to you. As we remember today, make our memory be more than just that. Let it be living. As we seek to right the wrongs that are among us in our own personal lives, in the lives of the communities in which we live and work and have our being. And today, don't let us be missing from action. As we join you in your work among us to make the world a place that freedom rings and individuals have rights of choice to worship you, to serve you. So today, bless us and remind us that we are holding hands. For we pray in your name, our Creator. In your name, our Savior and Sustainer. And in your name, the life, breath, giving spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Eaton. Okay. Um, I'd like to just uh, ask to accept our apologies for the difficulties we had with our AV program during the music of the branches of service. And I was also um, informed that we have omitted the, the Sikh community's DVD, so our apologies. If we could take a moment to recognize our Sikh partners who have joined us today. Thank you. Uh, that being said, we would like to thank all of the Memorial Day committee members and all the community groups who gave their time and talents in the planning and presentation of this combined community's observation. Please thank them for their dedicated time and service. A special thanks to our event co-chairs, John Selke and Chuck Lincolnheld. They truly poured their hearts into creating such a meaningful observance. Please join us in acknowledging all their hard work. We would also like to invite everyone to join us on the picnic grounds for some refreshments and hot dogs after our program. At the end of our Memorial Observance Program, members of the VFW Post 2202 and American Legion 1983 will dismiss you row by row. We ask that you remain in your seats until after the retrieval of our colors and the musical tribute. Thank you for being with us today.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as our color guard retrieve our nation's colors. Once again, we ask that you wait until after the Spring Valley Concert Band finishes playing Freelance Victory March, and then we will usher you out. Thank you again for attending our Memorial Day observance. Color guard, retrieve the colors. <laughs> <laughs> 